Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here today. Beautiful day that the Lord has given to us. Sunshine, but it's not roasting us yet, is it? Praise the Lord for that. All right, we are going to start by singing Jesus, Thank You. And so if you're able to stand, please stand with us, and we'll start with that one today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, worship team, for uh, starting our service this morning. Welcome to New Life. Thank you so much for joining us as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus together. Would you grab your bulletin, please? I want to highlight just a couple quick announcements, and then I believe uh, Jim Halas has our scripture and prayer this morning. Yeah, there you are. Thank you, Jim. A um, couple things. Read through this, please, uh, on your own. I just want to highlight a couple, but all of them are important. Uh, next Sunday, uh, next Sunday, the 12th, we have a potluck uh, immediately following our service here. So you can read that and see what you can bring if you would enjoy uh, joining us for that. Looking ahead a little bit later in the month on the 26th of September, that's another Sunday morning, we are going to have a uh, brief informational meeting on the pursuit of a next generation staff person and that idea. We will update you on uh, what the elders have been talking about. We had another productive meeting this past Thursday night. We praise God for that. And perhaps an update on the idea of property expansion. Uh, we are praying to that end, uh, but we will see how the Lord leads. So please continue to pray. Uh, we are continuing to ask the church body to pray for these things, and uh, we will share an update on the 26th. 
Last thing I want to mention is the Simeon uh, course flyer. We are kind of getting down to the point where uh, you need to be deciding on whether or not to take the course. I would love for you to do that. You can read all about it here on the flyer. We start September 22nd. But the thing I want to stress this morning is next Sunday, the 12th, we're going to have a quick meeting about that as well. So right after the service, we might just kind of meet in the back here of the sanctuary uh, and it'll be brief so we can get to the potluck if you're doing that. Um, but this is a meeting that if you have any interest at all in the course, you should try to be there. Uh, it does not commit you to taking the course, but I always say please try to get to that if you have any interest at all. If you know, if you're like, yes, I, I'm in, I want to take it, see me anytime. I can help you get registered uh, even before next Sunday when we have that meeting. All right? Thank you, Jim. Come on forward and, and lead us in prayer in the word, please. morning all morning. this morning I'm opening second Timothy chapter 3 the headline on here on mine on my version is godlessness in the last days so second Timothy chapter 3 but mark this there will be terrible times in the last days people people will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godlessness but denying its power, having I'm sorry, having the form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men opposed the truth. Men of depraved minds who are as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned, and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the men and women of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we're, as we're gathered here before you to, to glorify you, to, to give you praise, to thank you for your grace and your mercy and your peace, in the songs we sing and in the opening of your word, uh, the, your precious scripture, which is God breathed, the Holy Spirit has, has given this to us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are here. We thank you that you have chosen us and we can come here freely to glorify you and to just build your kingdom 
here on earth. I pray, I pray for the, the, the offerings uh, that are given this morning, Father, the, give, us, give us the wisdom that we need to use those funds to lift people up, to, to, to use them in a way that will glorify you, that will show your strength and your love to everyone around us in the community. Just, just give us the wisdom, Father, and, and uh, the strength to, to, to fulfill that. I also, I also lift up Pastor as he continues in our re Revelation study. Father, in his, in his work this week, in, in studying and, and uh, getting ready to expound on this, if there's, if there's anything you want him to say, Father, just, uh, just uh, give, him the, give him the wisdom, give him the strength that the Holy Spirit will speak through him. And well, if there's you know anyone that needs to hear just a, a small word that will convict them to to come to Christ, just uh, embolden him today, Father. So in all these things, th thank you, Jesus, that you're here through through communion that we're going to celebrate the the, the sacrifice that you did, Father, through Christ in your name. Let's stand again and uh, sing How Deep.
Thank you, worship team. One of, one of my favorite songs uh, that we sing on a regular basis, that last one. Amen. Thank you for leading us. Join me in the book of Revelation, please. In the book of Revelation, the last book in God's Word. There are Bibles under the chairs here in this room, under the television, in our fellowship hall. Find your way to Revelation chapter 7 this morning, chapter 7. Over the last few weeks, we have uh, been in some pretty hard, sobering, uh, even terrifying territory. In Revelation 6, we saw the start of the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth against sin and Satan and evil. We watched as the first six seal judgments have been enacted on the earth. That little star that I added this week is where we are today in the timeline. We have seen the first six seal judgments enacted. We are yet in between uh, waiting for the seventh. We've seen things such as false peace on the earth, then war, Famine, terrible economic woe, disease, natural disasters, and death. Last week we saw the reality of the martyrdom of massive amounts of believers on the earth during that time. And then we saw these majestic signs of God that caused great human fear. In fact, don't forget how we ended last time. Would you find the end of chapter 6 if you have found your way to Revelation 7? Go back and look at the end of chapter 6. After the signs in heaven and on the earth, mankind cries out, screams out, mountains and rocks fall on us, hide us from the face of the one on the throne, hide us from the face of the and the wrath of the Lamb for great, the great day of their wrath has come. And what's the question at the very end? Who can stand? Stand. Who can bear this? This is where we have been over the past couple of weeks together here at New Life on Sunday mornings in our study of the book of Revelation. And as one author said of our text today, we could use a break. <laughs> Here we are at the start of the football season. Uh, Iowa and Iowa State both got wins yesterday, and now we enter the crazy week of their game together. Football games have a break, don't they? A halftime. Where players can rest and regain their energy, coaches can sharpen their strategy. When you watched the Olympics this last summer, and swimmers, if you're like us at our house, we love the swimming. And swimmers like Katie, the great Katie Ledecky, they, they needed time in between events, right? That was the dialogue around her is, oh, she has so much, so, so little time between her events. But you need some time to go into that little pool and do some cool down laps, right? Between events. When Amy and I went to New York a few years ago and saw a Broadway play, there was an intermission in the middle uh, so that the audience could stretch and use the bathroom, and I assume so that the actors could do similar things. We don't see this anymore, but back in the day, movies used to have a intermission, right? Some of you remember that. The one I always think of is from the one seen here, the Ten Commandments. So long, you need a break in there, right? Even Jesus told the disciples in Mark chapter 6, after a busy season of ministry to, quote, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest, rest. We see the presence of these breaks around us in the culture and the necessity even of these breaks. Someone has said after the judgments of chapter 6, we could use a break right about now in the book of Revelation. Folks, chapter 7, our text today, is that break. There is no doubt that this is an intermission, an interlude chapter, if you will. In chapter 7, there is a change of tone. 
The seventh seal is not broken until 8-1. In fact, look at your copy of God's Word. Find 8-1. There you will find the breaking of the seventh seal. So what of chapter 7? What's happening here? And perhaps most telling of all, there's a change of focus in this chapter. We've been dealing with God's judgment upon the ungodly in chapter 6. Starting in chapter 7, we see a shift to a focus on God dealing with the godly. We've been looking at God's dealings with those who have rejected him and those whose Jim's text this morning spoke of. In chapter 7, we see God's dealing with his people. There's a change. It's been a heavy couple of weeks, full of God's wrath, and we could use a reminder of his mercy. That's where we get the title for today's message at the top of your notes, a reference, by the way, to the book of Habakkuk. In wrath, remember mercy, O God. <laughs> Habakkuk 3.2. In wrath, remember mercy. In the midst of God's wrath in the book of Revelation this morning, we're going to see God extend his mercy, listen, to two different groups in this chapter. And although it is refreshing for us, chapter 7 is also one of the most difficult chapters to interpret in the entire book of Revelation. When I was preparing for this series, I took the Simeon course on apocalyptic literature in the Bible. We're doing the Simeon First Principles course here in a couple of weeks. I mentioned that earlier. They also offer several different courses. And so uh, to help me in this series, I went through their course on apocalyptic literature in God's word, which, of course, is Revelation and parts of Daniel, parts of even uh, Ezekiel. And wouldn't you know it? One of the first things they talked about, D.A. Carson was the first uh, teacher, one of the first things that he talked about in the first session was chapter 7 <laughs> of Revelation and the difficulties of handling this chapter. So I've had this chapter kind of in the back of my mind. In a book full of challenging interpretive options, chapter 7 is among the hardest. Alan Johnson is a commentator I've been trying to read in this series, and he said of our chapter 7 today, confessedly, this is a difficult chapter. <laughs> and that made me chuckle, and I just thought, just say, it's a hard chapter, confessedly. Chapter 7 has its challenges, especially centering on the identity of these two groups. But, big picture... Big picture. Today we're going to see two groups that are recipients of God's mercy in the midst of his terrible displays of wrath. It's the refreshing interlude or halftime or break that we could use right about now. Chapter 6, listen carefully please. Chapter 6 ended with mankind crying out, who can stand in the tribulation? Who can withstand the judgments of God and the wrath of God? And listen, chapter 7 answers that question. By God's mercy, these two groups can stand, can endure. Let's pray together, and then we will dive into this wonderful text. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that by your mercy, these groups can stand in the great day of God's wrath, your wrath. Father, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to understand as best we can this difficult, confessedly difficult chapter. Help us to see the big picture, the great display of your mercy. Father, we continue to pray for your wisdom, your unity, your leading concerning possible expansion of our property and concerning the idea of a staff person here at New Life that would focus on the next generation. Please help us. I thank you for just the conversations that we elders have had and look forward to uh, expanding that conversation to the body as a whole and, and hearing 
thoughts, questions, feedback, and, and Lord, I just pray that you continue to work. And if we are off track in any way, shape, or form, that you would stop us. If we are uh, pursuing what you want us to pursue, that you would open doors, Lord, in your timing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take a look at the first group, the first group of mercy receivers in this uh, chapter. Let's start by just reading the text together, shall we? We're going to break the chapter up into two parts according to the two groups. So let's just read about the first group. Look at verse 1. After this I, of course this is John, after this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea. And here's what he said. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. And then if you would just notice, he gives 12,000 for each of the following tribes. Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and finally 12,000 as the other were from the tribe of Benjamin. In verse 1, we are told that John sees four angels. Four angels. Remember where we are, folks. It's been a while. We are in heaven. John is in heaven with this vision that began all the way back in chapter 4, verse 1. He now looks and he sees four angels standing at, we are told, the four corners of the earth. This was a phrase back in ancient times to... Uh, used to describe the whole of the earth. Uh, somehow in John's vision, he can tell that these angels are standing in such a way as to be overseeing the entirety of the earth. Now, notice what they are doing. They are holding back the four winds of the earth that they may not blow on earth, sea, or against tree. There seems to be fairly common agreement here that the winds are a reference to the ongoing judgments of God on the earth. In other words, the first six seal judgments that we have seen already and the judgments to come are now pictured as winds. But notice here, these angels are, are now holding them back. They are restraining them. Some see this as a literal stillness on the earth at this time. There will be like no wind at all during this intermission. I don't think that's necessarily included here, though it could be. What we are looking at here is the fact that God is now withholding this, uh, his ongoing judgments. This is a pause, folks, a half time. Next, verse 2. We are told that John sees another angel rising from the east, rising with the sun, which, as far as we know, still happens in the east, right? The angel calls out to these four angels over the whole of the earth, do not harm earth, sea, trees. So, now we know why they are restraining the judgments of God. They have, uh, they have been commanded to. Restrain, hold back the judgment until something is done. And now we are told what this halftime pause is all about and for. The angel reveals to us, look at verse 3, that he is going to seal the servants of God on their foreheads. Many believe that the king's signet ring is in mind here. We have talked about this imagery already in this book. 
The king in John's day would have a ring with his personal emblem on it. Things would be sealed with this ring. And people would know this document, for example, is officially from the king. This angel is is carrying with him the seal of the living God. Think about that, verse 2. He carries God's seal and he tells the four angels, stop the judgments until he can seal the servants of our God. Now, we'll talk in a little bit about this seal and what might be going on with that. But I think it would be helpful first for us to identify these servants of God. Who are they? (coughs) Excuse me. As mentioned earlier, this is one of the great debates of this difficult chapter. Who are these folks being sealed? I will tell you the common interpretive options, and then I will give you my thoughts. It basically boils down to two main options or positions. First, there are those who see this group as the church, the church. The servants of God, who were later told are 144,000, and we have the language of the tribes, the church. If you hold this position, you would likely see the numbers used here as symbolic, We have discussed already in this book that the number 12 is symbolic in terms of completeness. And so you would see John using multiples of 12, 12, 12, 12,000, 144,000 in these verses, listen, to represent the idea of completeness, the completeness of the church. If you see this group as the church, you would probably see John, listen, symbolically using the term Israel for the church and symbolically the language of the tribes for the church. The second common interpretive option here is that these are ethnic Israelites. These are Israelites. And I have to tell you, this is the option that I like best at this time. It seems to me that the plain reading of this text suggests that these are Israelites. We are told that these are 144 sealed individuals from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then we are told that each of the 12 tribes listed here will have 12,000 sealed from them. By the way, let's talk a minute about this list, this list of the tribes and the number from each tribe. This is the only time in the entire New Testament that the tribes of Israel are listed. The only time in the New Testament. Several times listed in the Old, right? Only time in the New Testament we see a list of the 12 tribes. It is a unique list from the other listings in the Old Testament. Judah is first when we might think who should be first. Who was the firstborn of Jacob Israel? Reuben. He's second on the list, isn't he? Do you notice? Judah is listed first. Why might he be listed first? Most believe, of course, because Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, God in the flesh, is from the tribe of Judah. It's curious that Levi is listed. Uh, In many lists, Levi is not listed. You recall that they did not receive an allotment of land. It's curious that he's on the list. Joseph is listed here. That's curious. Many times the lists have his grandsons listed, Manasseh and Ephraim. It's not Manasseh and Ephraim here. It's Joseph and Manasseh. Ephraim isn't even found on the list. And then perhaps most curious of all, do you notice a name that's not on there? at all. One of the 12 tribes. Nowhere to be found is Dan, the tribe of Dan. Curious. Some suspect that because Dan fell into idolatry, you might remember this, the worship of idols from Judges chapter 18, perhaps that is the reason why Dan is not listed. There has been much said on this list in Revelation and about about, uh, why it is the way that it is. But for our purposes this morning, I just note some of those observations with you. All this to say, folks, I like the second interpretive option better at this time. These are 144,000 ethnic Israelites sealed by God before the judgments of God resume. This is mercy. This is mercy. 
Now, with all of that said about them, we move on to the second major group in this chapter, starting in verse 9. But before we go there, let's try to, to summarize this first group, can we? Can we look at the big picture and what it means, this first group? Let's say this first. This group of 144,000 Israelites are protected from the judgments of God to come. We've already seen the first seal judgments of God broken or enacted. Obviously, their lives have been protected in that time, in the midst of those. But listen, as terrifying as the wrath of God was in those, believe it or not, the judgments to come are even worse, the trumpets and the bowls. But listen, folks, the revelation in this chapter is that God is sealing 144,000 Jews for protection in those to come. They will be protected from the trumpet and bold judgments about to be released, and they will survive the last three and a half years of the tribulation. We talked about timing last week. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that I would come back to the idea of this seal. What is going on with this seal? As you might expect, like almost everything in this book, there are a variety of different views. Some think that this is actually a reference to the fact that these Israelites will be baptized. That is their seal. Some think that it refers to the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. I like that better than the, the baptism option. Paul calls the Holy Spirit a seal for the believer in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Others think that this is just God's protection. In other words, there's not going to be a physical sign of a, a seal. This is just language that describes God's protection during the last part of the tribulation. They will survive. Still others believe this is an actual physical seal on their foreheads. You will be able to see a mark of God's protection on them. By the way, we are told that in John's day, uh, slaves would often be marked by a symbol of ownership on their forehead. It's very interesting that John calls these individuals what? Servants or bond servants. Interesting. Is that a clue to what's going on here? It will be a literal mark? Well, perhaps, perhaps. Again, don't forget, uh, don't forget the common refrain for us in this study. Don't miss the big picture by getting so wrapped up in the details. Whatever this seal is, the point is God is protecting this group from the tribulation to come. This much is clear. Scholars seem to universally agree the idea of this seal carries with it the themes of ownership and protection. Ownership and protection. And God is saying here, refrain the judgments for a moment, pause, go out, seal those who are mine, and I will protect them. Ownership and protection. Now, the question remains, why? <laughs> Why is God doing this? Is there a purpose behind this? And so let us note secondly, before we move on, these Israelites are sealed for the purpose of witness, for the purpose of witness. This is a very common thought among scholars. It is believed that God is doing this for the purpose of an effective witness for him on earth during the last part of the tribulation. Don't miss that they are called bond servants of God. They are believers. These Israelites have come to see the truth, and isn't this beautiful, that, the, that Jesus of Nazareth was and is the Messiah <laughs> that they have longed for. They will trust in Jesus for salvation during the first half of the tribulation, and it is commonly agreed that the purpose of their protection is to witness to mankind during the last half of the tribulation. John MacArthur put it, uh, puts it this way. He says they, these 144,000 Israelites, will have remained faithful to God and the Lord Jesus and will have probably been powerfully and effectively preaching his word in the midst of the chaos of the first six seals. We've already been there. 
at this point now, they are to be protected so that they can continue, that's a key word, continue to proclaim the word of God and the truth about Jesus during the most severe times. After the sealing is complete, the judgments can resume from which those sealed will be exempt or protected. By the way, before we move on, don't miss the fact um, that God is not done with the nation of Israel. Can we note that from this text? It's the only time in the New Testament that we see a list of the tribes. I, I think that's significant. Here at the very end of time, we see God take a large group of Israelites and listen, redeem them, save them, protect them, and unleash them for ministry in the darkest hour of the earth. God is not done with the nation of Israel. These 144,000 are protected for effective witness. All of this, loved ones, is under the first group of mercy recipients. We need to move on to our second if we're going to get through both of them. So take a look at verse 9, group number 2 that receives mercy, and let's read to the end. Verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice. Would you just read this with me? We're in the middle of verse 10. And crying out with a loud voice, say it, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Good, stop there. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Then he breaks out into song. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I'd like to approach this second group and the time remaining by talking about who they are and then we'll talk about the mercy that is given to them, okay? Who they are and then the mercy. Let's talk about who they are. In verse nine, we are told that John now looks and he sees a great multitude. So great is the group that he cannot count. However, it is very clear to him that this second group is comprised of a variety of different peoples. He says this group is made up of people from every nation, tribe, people, and language of the earth. We would say a multi-ethnic group. Brazilians, Chinese, Sudanese, German, Afghans, and Americans, Japanese, Korean, Russian, South African, and Australian, people of the Ivory Coast, in Uruguay, in Honduras, in Mexico, in Nepal, and in India, people from every part of this earth make up this group. We see them standing before the Lamb. By the way, notice that. How did chapter 6 end? Who can stand? And now here we see this group standing before the throne. Mercy. They're standing before the throne of God and the Lamb, verse 10, crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to God 
and to the Lamb. By the way, that's the only time they talk in this chapter. There's a lot of other talking going on. It's the only time we see this group talk in verse 10, the song they sing. So who is this group? And then we'll talk about the mercy they receive. Again, part of the great debate of this chapter. I couldn't help but chuckle when I read verse 13 this week, and again when I read it this morning. John sees this great multi-ethnic group worshiping God, and one of the elders just kind of saunters up to him and says, who are these guys? Where do they come from? And we want to say, great question. You tell us. (laughs) That's what the great debate is. The elder asked this of John because God wanted to reveal to us, the readers, something about the identity of this group, and we'll see that in a moment. But first, let me give you the option. It's, again, basically two. This is either the same group as the 144,000, or this is a different group. If you see this as the same group, and then let me put it this way. If you see the 144,000 as the general church, you typically see this multitude as the same, the same group. However, if you see the 144 as ethnic Jews, this cannot be the same group. Why? Because they are of every nation and people and tribe and language, right? It must be different. So to cut to the chase with this one, I believe this is not the same as the 144,000. I believe this is separate distinct group for the, from the first, though many wise and intelligent people feel otherwise. I will present to you that this is a vast group of believers, listen, from all across the globe who fit the answer of the elder in verse 14. What does the elder say? These, look at 14 again, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Listen, folks, these are believers who lived during the tribulation and are now worshiping in heaven. There is a couple sub-questions with this group, if you take that stand. That's one of the challenging things of this chapter. There's just layers of questions. Is this, one is about timing. Is this scene that John now sees with the second group at the end of the seven-year tribulation, or are we still kind of in the middle of it here? It's a good question. In addition, is this multitude just martyrs or all believers coming out of the tribulation? By the way, the timing question is a challenging one to me, less so the martyr question. I agree with with someone who pointed out that, that there just doesn't seem to be an obvious tie or theme with martyrdom in this second group. So here's what I would propose to you to be clear. This is a group of believers from all over the world who have lived at least part, through at least part of the tribulation and are now worshiping God in heaven. They have been shown mercy because they have come to believe in Jesus. Listen, they come to believe in him during the tribulation. I caught a bit of a conversation between two of you last Sunday and actually got in on it a little bit after the service last week. A couple of us were asking the question, how exactly will it be that people come to be saved during the tribulation? How will that happen? We were speculating, assuming that you hold to the rapture of the church before the tribulation starts. We were speculating. Will people be like breaking into abandoned houses of believers and finding Bibles that they left behind and and read God's word and be saved? Will people who had a church background and yet they rejected Christ, will they start to think back and realize, I heard about that, it's happening, and they humble themselves and they repent and believe upon Christ? Well, maybe, folks, maybe. But don't forget, and this is where the chapter sort of clicks for me, don't forget about the witness of the 144,000 that we just talked about. You have these Jewish witnesses protected during this time in order to witness boldly for Christ. And now, listen, in this next group, you have the results of their ministry during that time. 
God can work to save people in all sorts of ways during the tribulation. Bibles bringing up past teaching that they had previously rejected. Old DVDs laying around if we still have DVD players. YouTube sermons. We're going to see a special two witnesses later in this book. But don't forget about the group we just talked about. The 144,000. Sealed. Ethnic Israelites protected to boldly preach the name of Jesus on the earth in the darkest of days. And now John looks and he sees a multitude of people from all over the earth that have come to believe during the tribulation. The mercy of God here, folks. This is our theme. These can stand. <coughs> MacArthur summarizes it this way and kind of tries to click it together for us. If we could go to that MacArthur quote. Thank you. Um, there is coming in the future a worldwide response to the gospel that will far exceed any other in history and maybe all others combined. It will sweep the globe in just a few short years and produce a vast multitude of redeemed people, our second group, from all the nations, making it the greatest movement of God's saving power the world will ever see. That is a position that I offer to you to handle this difficult chapter. You may feel differently. You may have another position, but folks, I, I plead with you. I lovingly plead with you. Don't be so overwhelmed by your stance or by the stance I have presented to miss the point, the big picture, the mercy of God here. The mercy of God that both groups, whoever they are, receive. This is something that we all agree on, the mercy of God in this intermission chapter of chapter 7. In fact, I want to close by talking about the mercy given to this second group, which, by the way, is the bulk of this chapter. <laughs> Don't overlook that. In the Simeon First Principles course, we're going to talk about the emphasis of the text. Where does the weight of the text fall, the emphasis of the text? It's a great principle for handling God's word. The bulk of this commentary on the second group is about the mercy of God, isn't it? Long description of it. Just look at what's said about them. Do a survey with me as we close. Look at verse 9. These believers stand, and fill in these blanks if you want. They stand before the throne. 15 repeats it. 9 says it, and 15 says it. Look at 15. They are before the throne of God. What does this tell us about God's mercy? They're in heaven. They're with God. <laughs> to the one who believes in him, Jesus says in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. The mercy of God. They're before the throne. Keep watching. Look at verse 9 again. We are told that they are clothed with white robes. We've seen this before multiple times in this book. White robes can symbolize purity and righteousness. Notice what's said about their robes. I love this in verse 14. Look at 14. They've washed their white robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Think about that for a minute. At the risk of being a bit graphic, I picture in my mind a large tub containing the blood of Jesus, and they have taken their robes to the tub and submerged them in the blood, and they come out. White. <laughs> Think about that. What's the picture saying? The righteousness that this multitude has gained was given to them through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite gospel verses. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that we might become the white-robed group. <laughs> The righteousness of God. Mercy, loved ones. God withholding his wrath that we all deserve, that we sinners might have our robes made white in the blood of the Lamb. Keep looking. Verse 15. They serve him. They serve him day and night in the temple. When's the last time you, believer, thanked God for the mercy of just being able to serve him? I can serve the king. When's the last time you thanked him that through the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, he has gifted you to serve in the kingdom of the living God? 
Verse 15 also says, look at it. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Isn't this beautiful language used here? Shelter them with his presence. It reminds us of the imagery of the tabernacle and the temple. God dwelling with his people. John 1.14 says, Jesus came to earth and tabernacled with us. Dwelt with us is the word. It's the mercy of being face to face with God. Look at 16. We're getting to the language I especially love the most in this chapter. Verse 16, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. (laughs) One author noted the famine, famine that no doubt some of them, this multitude, lived through. Remember the third seal, famine? Interesting tie there. No more hunger in the presence of God. No more thirst. Does this speak to physical things? Yes. Does it also speak to spiritual realities? Yes. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. And here it is. Listen, folks, in his mercy, God gives the follower of Christ an eternal source, the word I think of, the eternal source of satisfaction. Satisfaction. You who are trying to find the foundational satisfaction in your life in money or sex or substances or entertainment or your favorite team or your possessions or your hobbies or your career, Jesus proclaims to you and this multitude shows you in this chapter satisfaction is foundationally only found in Verse 17 is a similar idea. Isn't this great? Look at 17. For the lamb is in their midst, in the midst of the throne, will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. Satisfaction. Look at 16 again. Daryl spoke to this earlier. I, I, I love what you said, Daryl, about just talking about the day today. The sun's out, but it's not scorching. Well, look at what 16 says. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. This can be a life verse for those of you who don't like the heat. (laughs) I remember growing up, and I still feel this way, the idea of like going to a park on a summer afternoon. It's like, why would anyone do that? Just sit out in the sun. I know not everybody feels that way. Not in heaven, folks. Not in heaven. No sun striking you, no scorching heat. Now, I'm being a little lighthearted about this. I agree with the one who said, most likely we're talking about, listen, the prevailing difficulties of life. The prevailing difficulties of life. The things, quote, that, are, that characterize this difficult journey on earth. No more. <laughs> no more. They're gone. By the mercy of God. And now one of my favorite parts in this description of his mercy. Look at, Go back to verse 9. Find it with me. What are they holding? Look at verse 9. What are they holding? This group, this second group of mercy receivers. They have palm branches in their hands. We might think that odd. You know, we, we may not click with the idea here uh, from this, from John's culture. Palm branches back in this time in biblical times were often used, and I'd have you write this down, used in times of celebration. <laughs> celebration. Think Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, palm branches. Think the Feast of Tabernacles that God ordained and told the, the Israelites to uh, celebrate, a uh, time of remembering and celebrating how God provided them Uh, provided for them in the desert. They waved palm branches. They built the huts with palm branches. Celebration, folks. What a change of tone in this chapter. In the midst of terrible displays of God's wrath, we have the multitude saved by God through the blood of the Lamb, and they're celebrating in heaven. To those of you who think Christianity is a stuffy, old-fashioned religious pursuit, to those of you who have believed upon Christ and yet your walk, is, your walk is characterized by a prevailing joylessness, 
Note this scene. The mercy of God of celebration. I love it. Finally, verse 17, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The pain, the suffering of this earth is wiped away. The tears of death, the tears of cancer and sickness, the tears of broken relationships, the tears of disappointment and unfair treatment and even persecution, the tears of heartbreak over your child, they're wiped away. Excuse me, they're wiped away. The mercies of God extended to this great multitude. Summarized, I think, in their song, last place to direct your attention to. Look at verse 10 again. Summarized in their song, salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb. Their song is about salvation. In a moment, I'm going to have the elders come forward to help serve the church body in communion. Communion is an ordinance that Christ left the church to participate in, listen, in order to remember his mercy. His mercy. We began by saying this morning that we could use a break, a rest, a halftime, an intermission. We have that in chapter 7. After the first six sealed judgments have been broken, the inhabitants of the earth cry out, who can stand in this? And according to this chapter, the 144,000 can stand. Protected Israelite believers in the tribulation who boldly witness to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And according to this chapter, the great multitude can stand. People of every ethnicity who believe upon Christ, no doubt in part to the witness of the first group. This is the mercy of God, loved ones. This is God remembering mercy in wrath. And the same mercy shown to those in this chapter is available to you and I today. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the salvation we need from sin and death. And that is what we remember today at the communion table. Elders, if you would join me uh, in these moments, please, as they come. I remind you what the scripture says about communion. This is a practice that Christ has left for his church, for believers. If you have recognized your sin before God and trusted in Christ's death and resurrection alone for your forgiveness, we invite you to participate with us. You don't need to be a member here. You don't need to be um, a regular attender even. I know we have guests with us this morning. If you are in Christ, a believer, child of God, we invite you to join us this morning. We will be serving the bread. Uh, if you would hold it, please, we'll pray together, then partake together, and then we'll do the same thing with the cup. And I would encourage you in these quiet moments to reflect upon the great mercy of God that he has shown to us.
ask uh, Daryl Victorine if you would give thanks for the cup or the bread, please. James, if you want to turn this on. Thank you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, uh, I know that uh, we've looked at your mercy and it means so much to us, um, but especially in light of, of your wrath, which, uh, which we saw in the previous chapters and and it's just and it's right. I mean, you, you are holy and and perfect in all your ways, and you made us, made man, um, innocent. And it was our own choices, our own sin that has turned us away from you. And and you are right, rightfully, angry and full of wrath at mankind for that. And so I I know that uh, we talk to you the one who has all power and, and ability to destroy your enemies and um, punish those who are sinful. And we, we tremble at that thought. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so in light of that, our, our talk about mercy uh, shines so bright. And we think of the cross and, and um, Jesus, the Holy One, actually dying to forgive our sins when you could justly and rightly destroy us for them. How much mercy we've received. What a great, great blessing. Um, life instead of death. Um, welcoming us into your family instead of punishing us. What, how privileged we are to be called your children and um, to uh, um, enjoy the grace of our Savior Jesus. So thank you for this, uh, this bread, this representation of Jesus giving his body um, to turn away your wrath from us, O oh Father. We are humbled by that and thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And we saw in this text today said of this group of believers, um, they're before the throne of God. They will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. The lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus left this ordinance to us saying, do this in remembrance of me.
Josh, would you return? Thanks for the consoles. Lord God, my Father, um, Lord, we come before you, Lord God, to remember. To remember, Lord God, um, the suffering, Lord God, that your son Jesus went through on the cross. There's so much depth as to what happened that day on the cross as he rose from the dead, but it, it's, but it boils down to salvation, Lord. Salvation for people that don't deserve it, Lord God. But out of your mercy and your grace, your son died on the cross for our sin, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord God, for, for Jesus' um, sacrifice, Lord, as he laid down his life for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We saw today it was said of this second group, uh, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The cup representative of, of the blood of Christ. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Worship team, if you would come, please. And uh, would you all stand with me? And let's sing our closing song together. <laughs> 